Welcome back, everybody, to another week of Sunday School here at the Lighthouse Church of the Nazarene in Moravia, Iowa, where we are going through the book of John right now. Um, last week, we started John chapter 12, and we're in the middle of John chapter 12 right now, but we are in the last week of Jesus's life. Now, this last week of Jesus's life is started with Mary of Bethany anointing the feet of Jesus in the house of Simon the leper, and then we had the triumphant entry in which Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Um, this also fulfilled to the day the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, which uh, 400 and I believe 84 years earlier that uh, Daniel predicted to the day that the Messiah would be presented to him. That was fulfilled at the triumphant entry. Now, one thing we don't get in John's account, but we do get in Mark and Luke's account about this uh, triumphant entry, is that the donkey that Jesus was riding on had never been ridden before, which in and of itself is just another one of Jesus's miracles. So we're going to finish. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 16 of John chapter 12. So let's get out our Bibles. Let's follow along. John chapter 12, verse 16 which says, this is just right after Jesus was riding on a donkey and they're praising him. It says, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to them. Now, this should actually make us feel a little bit better because here's Jesus's disciples. They'd walked with Jesus for three years. They'd seen all his miracles. They'd listened to all his teachings. And they still didn't understand everything. So when we have problems understanding everything, this should bring us comfort. Even the disciples didn't understand everything at first. Verse 17. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. So the same people that saw that were with him when Lazarus came out of the tomb, they're praising Jesus. Verse 18. For this reason the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now, this is another one of those inadvertent prophecies spoken by the Pharisees. Um, like earlier when Caiaphas said that it was better that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation shouldn't perish. He, he was prophesying that Jesus would die for the people. Right here, what do, what do they say? They say the whole world is going after him. Now, Right now, it's just a few Judeans that are going after Jesus. But guess what? It, it will be the whole world because the entire world, world will go after Jesus. Um, it's in Acts 1.8 um, where they say, and where Jesus says, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, Jesus said it. it's in the 24th chapter of Matthew where he says, uh, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. So the whole world is going to follow after Jesus. Now, is everybody in the world going to follow him? No, but to the ends of the earth, the name of Jesus Christ will be spread. Verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Now, it says here there were certain Greeks. Who are these guys? We really don't know. The, the Greeks could just be a, a generic term for the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Also, they could be Greeks. They could be what are known as proselytes, Gentiles that converted to Judaism. Uh, it's actually a little puzzling right here why John included this little bit, because it doesn't appear that Jesus even granted their request to have a conversation with them. We don't get that. So why John put it in there? I, I don't know the answer to that. And another thing that uh, we can throw in here, between verses 19 and verses 20, John doesn't tell us, but Jesus would have cleansed the temple where he went in and drove out all the money changers and overturned their tables. Remember, we get two accounts of Jesus cleansing the temple, one at the beginning of his ministry and one at the end. That would have taken place right here. All right, let's keep going. Verse 23, but Jesus answered them and saying, so Philip and Andrew come and say, hey, there's these certain Greeks who want to, talk to you. But then it says, but Jesus answered them. So it doesn't appear that he ever talked with them. It says, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. The hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Up until now, what has Jesus been saying at the, at the wedding at Canaan Galilee? 
Um, Jesus' mother said to him, hey, they have no wine. And Jesus says, what does this concern have to do with me? My time has not yet come. In the seventh chapter of John, his brothers say to him, hey, depart from here and go into Jerusalem that everybody may see what you're doing. And Jesus says, no, my, my time is not ready. And twice, actually, it says that people wanted to lay hands on him, but his hour had not yet come. And we just get a short account of Jesus's three years of ministry. So we get all these accounts of Jesus saying, my time has not yet come. I'm guessing he said that a lot. But what did Jesus just tell him right now? He's been telling him, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Now he says, it's time, guys. I'm guessing his disciples probably went, whoa. What's going to happen now? They probably had goosebumps after this. Jesus said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verse 24, most assuredly, I, what is old King James? It says, verily, verily, I think, or most truly is the NIV. When Jesus says, most assuredly, it, it's double em emphatic. It's, hey, listen up. You're about to hear something important. So Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, Jesus is not giving us an agronomy lesson here. This is a principle of sacrifice. But Jesus is saying, oh, I got a cat on the table. Get down, kitty. What Jesus is saying, sorry about that, is that we have to give up our own lives to bless others. A seed by itself not planted is pretty worthless, is it not? A single kernel of corn, it won't even feed a chicken for a half a day. But if you put that seed in the ground, it can produce 500, 1,000, 1,500 kernels of corn. What did Jesus say in the parable of the sower? Some seed falls on good ground and produces a hundredfold. So Jesus is saying, you know, this grain of wheat, you know, unless it goes into the ground and dies, it's worthless. Jesus is saying, I'm about to die so that we can have abundance of life. Uh, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. So let's keep going here. Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. When Jesus says that we should hate our life, he also um, uses the phrase that he who does not hate his father and mother and brother and sister, it, it's just a comparison. It doesn't mean we need to hate this life like, boy, I just hate life. I can't wait to get out of here and get to heaven. No, every day is a blessing of God. What a privilege it is to just breathe his air, is it not? But it's just we can't love this life. We can't live for ourselves. Um, let's keep. Let's read the end of this. Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it. So that's if you just live for yourself, if you're just worried about what makes you happy, guess what? You're, you're going to lose our life. But if he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. To hate our life means that we would freely give it up for Jesus. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and, and everything else will be taken care of. Most of us, what do we do? Most of us seek our own kingdom. Uh, Romans 12, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That, that's what our life should be, a living sacrifice. As I just said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. And this life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. Um, Jim Elliott, he was, he was a missionary to Ecuador. And he ended up getting killed by the same people that he was trying to witness to. But he had a great quote about this. He said, he is not unwise who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So this is a great principle right here. Jesus says, if you just live for yourself, your, your life is worthless. But if you give up your life for my sake, guess what? You're going to get to have eternal life. Verse 26, Jesus says, if anyone serves me, let him also follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. This is actually an important point right here. Christianity, being a follower of Jesus, is not just an initial response and then nothing afterwards. But it's a lifelong commitment. Um, Jesus says we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. Uh, it's Revelation 2.10, I believe. It's where um, Jesus says, he who endures to the end will be saved or be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, another, I think it's in Matthew 24, Jesus says, be faithful to he who endures to the end will be saved. So Christianity, if Jesus says, if anyone serves me, 
let them follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And so Christianity, it just can't be an initial response. Oh, I, I was saved when I was eight years old, and but I haven't done anything since. No, it's, it's a lifelong commitment. Verse 27, Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it is for this purpose that I came to this hour. Now, why is Jesus troubled? Why is his soul troubled? Well, he is a man. He refers to himself as the son of man, if you notice that. That's actually a reference to the book of Daniel, where Daniel says, I saw one like the son of man. But Jesus, he was a man, and he knows that he's about to endure an excruciating death. But also, his soul is troubled because he knows that he's about to experience separation a fellowship from God the Father. When Jesus is going to be on the cross, what is he going to say? He's going to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So his soul would be troubled from that, that he's about to lose his fellowship with the Father while he's on the cross. Verse 28, Father, glorify your name. So Jesus just spoke to the Father and he said, Father, glorify your name. And guess what happens? He does it. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Three times that we know of, that we read of in scripture, in Jesus's ministry, do we hear an audible voice from heaven? We do it at his baptism, which says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear him. At the transfiguration, we hear the same voice and it says the same thing when he's up high on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. And we have it here, three times, an audible voice from the father in Jesus's ministry. Verse 29, Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. This takes away the argument right here that if people would just see a miracle, they would believe. These people right here that said, oh, it, that must have just been the thunder. These are what we refer to as naturalists. And people try to do that in the Bible. For instance, uh, some people will say, oh, when all the hogs ran down into the sea, that was because the demon-possessed men just scared them and they ran off. No, God had control over all of that and, and everything that happened. You know, These people are going to try to explain away the miracle by saying, oh, that, that was just the thunder. It sounded like a voice, but surely not. Let's keep going. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. So Jesus is saying, so that you guys would believe, God spoke. Verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now, how is this the judgment of the world? How is Jesus hanging on the cross, the judgment of the world? Because all who are opposed to God, they will be judged for crucifying him on a cross. Excuse me. But then we see this right here. What did Jesus say? He said, the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who is the ruler of this world? Believe it or not, the Bible tells us that Satan is the ruler of this world. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 refers to him as the God of this age. Um, Ephesians 2, 2 refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. And in John 14, 30, in just a little bit, Jesus says, the ruler of this world is coming and, and I have nothing in it. So we might ask, well, why does God allow Satan to have so much power on this earth? Here's the answer. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But, and also I think about this. When it says that the ruler of this world will be cast out, I really don't know what Jesus is referring to here either. I, I guess I'm just going to have to confess. I don't understand it. Because uh, when Jesus sent out his 70 disciples and they came back and they said, hey, even the demons, you know, that the, they're susceptible to you. And, he, and then Jesus says to him, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So, when it says the ruler of this world will be cast out, is he was he cast out of heaven to the earth right here? Um, in the book of Revelations, it says that he's still the accuser of the brethren. That, you know, in the book of Job, it says that he had access to God. So what is Jesus saying right here? Uh, plain and simple. I'm going to have to punt on this one and say, I really don't know. Verse 32, and Jesus says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So when Jesus says, if he's lifted up, it means he's referring to his crucifixion. He's high and lifted up. So first off, he says, I will draw all people to myself. Here's a question. Does all mean all? I would say so. Jesus says, I will draw the entire world to myself. Um, 
I think this. I think uh, not one person will be able to stand in front of the Lord and say, you didn't give me a chance. You know, John chapter 6, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. You know, It is the Father that draws us in, but not one person will be able to stand in front of the Lord and say, you didn't give me a chance. Because Jesus said, I will draw all people to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Uh, therefore, the people answered him, saying, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Um, I'm going to end right here on this point right here. The people answered, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. That's because in the Old Testament, it says, Of his rule and reign, there will be no end. It says he will have an everlasting government. But they said, why must the Son of Man be lifted up? They knew he was talking about the crucifixion. So why did Jesus have to be crucified? Why did he die on a cross? Because of this, because the punishment of sin is death. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God is the perfect and righteous judge. Now, could a judge just pardon lawbreakers and let them off scot-free? No, that somebody would have to pay the offense. If I did something evil and had to serve time, but say somebody else came and said, hey, I'll serve the time for him, that, that would be okay. That's what Jesus did. He said, hey, these guys deserve punishment. I'm going to serve that punishment for them. Put it all on me. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. And it's through his name alone that we can be found right with God and have eternal life. All right, guys, we're uh, two-thirds of the way done through John chapter 12. We'll finish it up next week. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Bye.